Good evening. Welcome to this episode of Cocktails of the Curator. I am Xavier Salomon, the Deputy Director and Peter J. Sharp Chief Curator at the Frick Collection. Just a few weeks ago, we opened Frick Madison, a temporary new home in the Breuer Building, which was designed in 1966 for the Whitney Museum of American Art. And at the very center of this installation of Frick Madison, in the middle of the third floor, you have the object that you see here. And this is uh, part uh, a great work of art of the, of the Frick, belonging to the Frick, and part a reconstruction which was made especially for Frick Madison. Just across from, um, from the, this, this object, uh, you see it here on the, on the left, is a little chapel with the Bellini St. Francis. But the central object was actually made in Tuscany by a Tuscan artist. And it is here seen in juxtaposition with uh, the portrait by Bronzino of Ludovico Capponi, another work made uh, in Tuscany and Florence uh, by a Florentine artist, uh, representing a Florentine patron. Because of this, I am drinking a twist on the most famous Florentine cocktail. In the late 19th century, Count Negroni invented the Negroni, the, 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 the famous cocktail, uh, supposedly first made on a bar in Via Tornabuoni in Florence. We've been drinking over some of the past episodes both a Negroni and a Negroni Sbagliato, which is another version of the Negroni. This is yet again another modern twist on the Negroni, and it's a white Negroni, a Negroni Bianco, which is equal parts of gin, of Lille Blanc, and of Suze. And Suze is uh, a liquor which was invented in France in 1889, and it is made um, from the root of a plant, of the gentian, uh, which is uh, an aromatic herb which grows uh, in the Alps. So this is a very herbal, um, flowery uh, drink. And as I say, it is uh, a version of the more traditional Negroni. Salute. When the Whitney commissioned Marcel Breuer to design this building, Breuer produced uh, a modern museum and produced a museum that was designed and conceived for modern and contemporary works of art. With Frick Madison, it is the first time that the entire building is actually inhabited by objects uh, which are much older. Uh, nothing really at the Frick uh, post-dates the late 19th, early 20th century. And none of the objects that are displayed in this museum were ever conceived to be in a museum. Uh, all of the artists, here you see, of course, Bellini and, and Bronzino in terms of the paintings and the central sculpture that we will be talking about, were all made for either domestic interiors or ecclesiastical interiors, churches, without an idea that these would eventually end up in a museum. I mean, the concept of a museum in 16th century Italy, for example, uh, was not something that was uh, conceivable in people's imagination. So one of the big dilemmas of us as curators is how do we bring some of this original context back into a building, into a museum, where works of art that were never designed to be shown together are uh, forced in a way together uh, by the circumstances of acquisition and, um, and uh, the, the fortunes of, uh, of history. Now, the central object that I'm talking about this evening is usually, yet again, in a very different context. Here you see the West Gallery at the Frick Collection at 170th Street, and you see the, the doorway that leads from the West Gallery into the Oval Room and through that to the East Gallery. And on the table, the large uh, wood table that you see in the foreground, you see three bronzes. All three of them are actually on display at Frick Madison, but the central one is uh, this small statue of St. John the Baptist in bronze by the Tuscan Renaissance artist Francesco da Sangallo. And here you see it on a base placed on the table. This in itself is a beautiful small sculpture. Uh, it is cast in solid bronze. It represents St. John the Baptist uh, in the act of baptizing. So he holds a, a shallow bowl in his right hand and with it, he is in the act of pouring water, uh, presumably over 
uh, a, a person who's being baptized. And of course, uh, John, as the precursor of, of Christ, uh, is often shown dressed in rough clothes as, as he inhabited the desert um, and uh, drawing water from the River Jordan, where he will eventually also baptize Christ. As an object in itself, the statuette looks uh, pretty complete on, on a pedestal on a table at the Frick. And in fact, it is one of the great sculptural works of art in the museum. Uh, when John Pope Hennessy wrote the catalogue of sculpture of the Frick collection, uh, the Italian volume uh, had on the cover an image of the San Gallo bronze. This is the only signed work in bronze by Francesco da San Gallo, who came from a family of artists. His father was the great architect, Giuliano da San Gallo. Uh, his uncle and cousins uh, were also architects, artists. And here you see him in a self-portrait medal, uh, showing him as, um, as a, a great um, character of, of those times, uh, wearing this rather uh, peculiar turban, sort of headgear, and elegantly dressed. Sangallo was uh, also himself an architect and, uh, and a sculptor, and he worked mostly in marble. And just to give you one example here, this is the life-size sculpture uh, of Paolo Giovio, the great intellectual in the Church of San Lorenzo in, in Florence, and this was made for uh, Giovio, Giovio's monument. Uh, you see the full statue signed at the bottom where he prominently signs himself as Giuliano da San Gallo's son, and you see a detail of the face. Well, you see how in the marbles, uh, San Gallo is playing with different textures, the texture of the beard, the, the flesh, the old flesh of, of Jovio, uh, the, the, um, the vestments of, uh, of his ecclesiastical uh, role. The John the Baptist, of course, is, uh, is a smaller sculpture, a uh, much more modest uh, work. But at the same time, uh, San Gallo again is playing with the different textures of the sculpture. So the haggard flesh uh, of, of, of the Baptist in the desert and the, uh, the rough um, outfit of fur and, uh, and skin that uh, the Baptist is, um, is wearing. Now, this object was originally made, as I mentioned at the beginning, for a very different context. And uh, during an episode of Travels with a Curator uh, last year, we traveled to the city of Prato. And we go back there to the same church of Santa Maria delle Carceri, which is the place for which the San Gallo sculpture was made. This stands on uh, a site in the center of Prato, which is northwest of Florence, very close to the castle, the medieval castle of Prato, which you see here on the right, which was built by Emperor Frederick II. And Santa Maria delle Carceri is named after the prisons, the Carceri of Prato, which uh, stood on this, uh, on this site. Because um, in 1484, a young boy of Prato had a vision, saw a fresco of the Virgin and Child on the walls of the prisons of Prato, on the exterior wall of the, of the so-called Stinke. And uh, the Virgin and Child appeared to him, came out of the wall. And uh, since that miracle in 1484, uh, a church was commissioned, a church which was patronized and, and, and paid for in great part by Lorenzo de' Medici, Lorenzo il Magnifico, and was designed by Giuliano da San Gallo. Francesco's father. As you can see from this image, the church was actually never quite finished. Uh, the facade uh, was left unfinished by Giuliano uh, in the 1490s, and then subsequently parts of it were finished, parts of it are still left with the rough brick that you see there. But this is a central church, centrally planned church with a central dome uh, with four equal um, parts, is what is called uh, technically a Greek cross uh, with equal arms. And um, you can enter it from, as you see in this image, from different doors. And the altar, the main altar, is on the wall on which the miraculous fresco uh, was placed to begin with. So the church is really built around this, this wall of the prisons, which is englobed in this new church for this miraculous image. Francesco works uh, in the church that his father designed and built. And the commission for this object is a commission that, to begin with, does not directly involve Francesco. So on the 22nd of March, 1534, uh, so we are 
uh, almost 50 years after the church uh, was was built and, and after the miracle, uh, the two groups of, uh, of people in Prato, the Ortolani, which were the vegetable sellers of the city, and the Poponai, which were the um, sellers of melons, of fruit, uh, together gathered um, an, an amount of money, 30 scudi, to pay uh, a stone cover, a man called Giovanni Francesco Pagni, to make an aqua santiera or a pila. And an aqua santiera and pila is a holy water stoop or a holy water font, and is the object that usually stands at the entrance of a church and that contains blessed water with which people then cross themselves as they walk in and out of a church. So as you walk into Santa Maria delle Carceri on the right, here is the aqua santiera uh, designed and carved by Pagni. But the Ortolani and Poponai didn't seem to have been um, altogether happy with the result. And the, the original commission of 1534 is just a lower part of this object. So if you see uh, the, col the base and column and the basin, that was what was made by Pagni. Four years later, in August 1538, the Ortolani and Poponai go to Francesco da Sangallo and ask him to enhance the Aqua Santiera with a statue. And so Francesco da Sangallo uh, adds the little column decorated with, uh, with leaves and the bronze sculpture on top of St. John the Baptist uh, baptizing. So as you see here, the basin would have originally contained holy water. And from the basin, uh, this, this, this column, this new added uh, pedestal is, is, is put on with the Sangallo sculpture on top. Now, the church kept this, this work all the way till the late 19th, early 20th century, when the, the sculpture, the bronze uh, John the Baptist by Sangallo, was sold. It went through a dealer, Bardini, who was a famous Florentine dealer, and then through a German collection, through the Morgan collection, until Frick acquired it together with all of, uh, well, a large selection of the Morgan bronzes. And by the end of the 19th century, all the way till quite recently, the original bronze Sangallo sculpture uh, has been displayed on a pedestal as a freestanding sculpture, um, as you've seen on a table in the West Gallery. Uh, even though it was always known that it came from Santa Maria delle Carceri, this context is somewhat lost. What happened in the church instead, which is rather interesting, is that in 1902, an exact copy in bronze of the John the Baptist was commissioned and placed over the Aqua Santiera. So when you go into Santa Maria delle Carceri today, you see the original marble um, Aqua Santiera, holy water font, with above it a modern 1902 copy of the Sangallo sculpture. And the Sangallo sculpture is so important for the church that another version of it is actually displayed over the baptismal font of uh, the Church of Santa Maria del Carci, which is behind in a space towards the sacristy. So here you see the niche with the font uh, below it. This is where uh, young children and infants uh, are baptized. And another version of the John the Baptist, again, modern, has been placed over it. So the sculpture is obviously linked very directly with the church, and it's still very much part of the iconography of the church. So as we were working on Frick Madison, the idea came about of bringing some of this context into a new temporary museum. And so we've been working with Factum Arte, uh, a group of wonderful people based in Madrid who have been working on uh, fabricating works of art and facsimile of, uh, of important works of art all over the world. Um, we worked very closely with the Church of Santa Maria delle Carceri, and what we decided to do was to create an exact replica of the holy water font to place as a, as a base for our original John the Baptist. So effectively doing the opposite of what happens in the church. In the church, you have the original base with a copy of the sculpture. We have the original sculpture with a copy of the base. Imagining that the marble base could, could come to New York even temporarily uh, is out of the question because of all sorts of logistical um, reasons. So the, the exact copy is what we could aim for. And so what we decided to do was to work with Factum Arte. This whole project was sponsored by uh, Fabrizio Moretti, who is, uh, is from Prato, and, and basically helped us bring a piece of his town 
to uh, to New York. So here you see part of the process where uh, a 3D rendering of the uh, of the holy water font was made after uh, very specific photography and uh, recordings of the of the original object in the church. And then this is um, the object being worked on in Madrid. Uh, this is, of course, not made uh, of marble as the as the original, but it's made out of either other lighter materials. But it imitates the 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 uh, look and feel of marble. In many ways, this project has also been a restoration project. And here you see on the left uh, the final result at Frick Madison, and on the right the original. And what you can see is that there are certain differences in color. And the differences in color are due to the fact that um, holding water, this marble basin over time has, of course, um, been um, somewhat changed in, in appearance. Uh, the base in which the, the sculpture is placed has a metal rod going through it, which over, over the centuries has rusted. And so some of the rust has now um, sort of covered part of the surface of the marble. The other detail which is different is that at the bottom of the original on the right, you can see that there, there are bronze letterings and these were probably added in the early 20th century. Um, and so there is an inscription now around the base of the, uh, of the, of the original Pila in Santa Maria del Carceri. And we decided in the replica to actually uh, ignore that, to, rep to, to not replicate that, in a way to restore the Pagni pedestal as it would have been uh, to begin with uh, in 1534. The sculpture is now at the top of, uh, of this facsimile. And what you can do now at Frick Madison for the first time in more than 100 years is you can actually see it at the right height in the right sort of position in space. And you realize that this is not a sculpture that you're meant to see from above on a table, but it's something that you're meant to see from below. And suddenly the proportions of the sculpture and the gesture of uh, the very elegant gesture of John the Baptist pouring water as he baptizes uh, people becomes a lot more um, logical. And so here again, you see the overall effect of this. Of course, even though we're trying to recreate the effect of Santa Maria delle Carceri, uh, of the original, um, there are some differences. And of course, with time, there are certain things that cannot be replicated. Uh, of course, the space, the surroundings are very different from the surroundings of Santa Maria delle Carceri, even though the coloring of this gallery with the gray walls and the concrete grid is not far off from the type of coloring with Pietra Serena and light gray walls that is used uh, in many Tuscan buildings of the 15th and 16th century. But the two main differences would have been uh, to do with, uh, again, some of the aspects of this object. First of all, the water in the basin for condition reasons, for conservation reasons, uh, we cannot replicate that. But you have to imagine that the basin would have had the very reflective surface of water in it. And the other difference is that the sculpture we now know from documents was originally gilded. So instead of having this brownish dark appearance, it would have been a bright gold sculpture. And of course, there is no way of reverting back to the original. And so imagine the interior of, of the church, candlelit, it's actually quite a dark church, Santa Maria del Carceri, uh, with this gold sculpture reflected in the water in the basin below, in the marble basin. Uh, so that is an effect that we can only imagine. But I'm very much hoping that this uh, temporary reconstruction of this work of art uh, will make people think about the original context of many of the objects in the museum and will bring back to you the feeling of seeing this wonderful sculpture by Francesco da Sangallo uh, in a situation, in a, in, a, in a surrounding which is much closer uh, to what Sangallo himself uh, imagined for it to begin with. And of course, as I said earlier, one of the great um, points of, of a museum is to explore and present uh, the original context of many of the works of art in the museum when we can do that and when we can uh, explain what that was uh, through research and through temporary solutions like this one. Thank you for joining us this evening, and I look forward to seeing you all um, soon with another episode of Cocktails with the Curator.